Hi everyone, welcome to this PowerPoint on disposal of solid waste. We're going to talk about two learning objectives, 8.9, which is solid waste disposal. Uh, the enduring understanding for this is that human activities, including the use of resources, have physical, chemical, and biological consequences for the ecosystem. So we're sticking with that same one that we've been at for quite a while. The learning objectives, you should just be able to describe solid waste disposal methods and describe the effects of solid waste disposal methods. And we're also going to be looking at topic 8.10, which is waste reduction methods. And the learning objective there is to describe changes in current practices that could reduce the amount of generated waste and their associated benefits and drawbacks. I'll skip the vocab as usual, but it is right here. And what do we mean when we talk about solid waste? Well, it's probably pretty straightforward, but this is a waste that's neither a gas nor a liquid. So it's solid trash. We typically use the terms trash, refuse, garbage um, for this type of waste. And we're going to include both hazardous and non-hazardous waste in this solid waste. Some of this is going to be totally benign. Some of it is going to be hazardous. And that's not to say that hazardous waste couldn't be a liquid. It absolutely can, and it often is. Um, for example, there's quite a few liquids in this list down here. Insect killer, um, glues, the acids inside of batteries, gasoline. All of those are hazardous wastes as well. But there's some hazardous wastes that are solids. Now, hazardous waste is potentially toxic or harmful to humans in the environment. We have these four categories of hazardous waste, and you should probably know these. Um, we have corrosive hazardous waste. So this is something that will um, corrode skin. It will corrode materials, um, corrode tissues. We have toxic hazardous waste, stuff that is just poisonous to humans and um, other animals. We have reactive hazardous waste, those with high reactivity and can um, have lots of different catalytic reactions inside of a landfill or you know in a human body or anywhere and then we have flammable hazardous waste and that's probably the most straightforward because they light on fire okay the u.s um it should be noted produces about a third of the world's solid waste so we are the most wasteful country um, on the planet we produce about a third of the of the solid waste on the planet and with generating about a third of the world's waste we are only about 4% of the world's population. So if we do some quick math, 333 million, which is about a good estimate of the US population size, divided by 8 billion people on the planet, times 100, gives us about 4%, 4.2% of the world's population. So per capita, we are the most wasteful country on the planet. Okay. Now this slide that I have this on, I'm actually going to skip this because we're not going to talk about plastic today. We're going to talk about plastic um, in reference to our lab that we'll do on microplastics. And we'll talk about some of the effects of plastic. But if you want to pause this and see some of the most common types of plastic um, and their toxicity levels and really for this, um, what is most commonly leached, what toxins leach from them, it's really interesting. Now, a quick list, um, some methods to dispose of solid waste. Landfills is where we're gonna spend most of our time here. We're gonna talk about recycling quite a bit. We've already talked about waste incineration. So I will reference you to waste incineration PowerPoints in our energy unit to talk about waste incineration. So we're not gonna talk about it a lot here. We're going to talk about composting. We're going to talk about legal dumping, but a lot of that was also in the one of the previous PowerPoints of this unit, not little litter, my bad, um, where we talked about litter and then oceanic dumping as well. But again, we talked about that in this litter one too. So we'll talk about it a little bit, but not too much. Where we're going to spend most of our time is landfills, recycling and composting. All right, landfills are definitely the most common disposal method and it's probably the um, best disposal method if you cannot compost, reuse, recycle um, a material. Okay, um, a little bit of history about landfills. Landfills used to be just be simple pits that people would throw solid waste into. Um, anything that was, you know, maybe kitchen waste or broken pottery um, would go into what we would call a midden if you're into archaeology or just a waste pit. Okay. Before the Industrial Revolution, almost all trash was biodegradable. Again, this means that it decays, that microorganisms can eat through it and it decays. 
if it wasn't biodegradable, it was at least non-toxic, okay? It might contain heavy metals, especially if we're talking about slag from, um, from metal smelting, but it was at least more or less non-toxic, okay? So a lot of the old waste was stuff like wood, bone, um, textiles, food scraps, ceramic, glass, etc. You can see the list down there. And if you go into, if you're into archaeology and if you watch a lot of archaeological um, shows, the ones that they can get out of these middens are the ones that don't decompose readily. Stuff like bone, um, pottery, ceramics, glass, maybe coins, um, anything that's that's metal is really good at um, preserving. Things like food scraps that would be in these middens, textiles, typically aren't preserved except under very rare circumstances. Same thing with wood, typically not preserved under very rare circumstances. However, after the Industrial Revolution, and especially in the plastic craze of the 20th century, waste became more and more and more um, toxic. Okay. Now, one thing that I want to talk about, we're going to talk about landfills in terms of the best case scenario. We're not really going to talk a lot about um, how landfills differ around the world, but I do want you to keep in mind that landfills are going to vary dramatically around the world. And waste disposal methods are as well, based off of um, the socioeconomic model in the country, infrastructure in that country, um, the availability of land in that country. So island nations are going to have less landfilling than large nations that have lots of empty space. And then the position on the demographic transition model. Let's start this off with a law, the, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. So this is one that you need to know. This is a U.S. law only, so United States law only. Um, started in or was signed into being in 1976. This is an amendment to the Solid Waste Disposal Act of 1965, which you don't really need to know. The Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, or RCRA, or um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it how some people do, but RCRA. It's it was due to a huge volume, a growing volume of industrial and municipal waste, especially hazardous waste. And it gave the EPA responsibility, like sole responsibility over controlling hazardous waste, um, essentially from the cradle to the grave. Now cradle to the grave um, essentially means from when it was made in a factory or in a laboratory to the time that's disposed of. And it set goals and regulations. Some of those goals and regulations include protecting human health, protecting of the environment, energy and natural resource conservation, reduction of waste generation, and mandates for safe ways to dispose of waste. And this has been really effective in making sure that a lot of solid waste um, ends up in landfills, and especially that hazardous waste ends up in landfills. And this has resulted in a cleaner United States. If you ever watch an old movie from the 60s or 70s, and you see just trash everywhere, especially if it's like a dingy looking city, that was the reality um, back then. There was just um, tons of trash all the time, everywhere, and there wasn't great waste disposal methods. But in the 1970s, due to the Resource Conservation Recovery Act in large part, um, we had much more um, efficient waste disposal methods. And the primary waste disposal method that we use is a sanitary municipal landfill. Now this was early, introduced in the early 1900s and it kind of caught on, but again, it wasn't until the 60s and 70s when the money was there and when the infrastructure was there and the demand was there to really um, bring these into widespread use. So these are in, in, intentionally constructed to minimize negative health effects and negative environmental effects. And in these landfills, I'll show a picture, a um, couple pictures of them and diagrams of them on the next slides. We essentially have five stages in the decomposition of waste. So now keep in mind that all, not all waste will decompose. Some waste will, but not all of it will. All right, so when you have a um, garbage truck that goes up to the landfill and dumps waste off of the landfill, that waste is added to the top of the landfill. And it's typically going to be exposed to the air or even buried near the top of that landfill. Oftentimes you'll bring in dirt so that you bury that waste so that uh, birds and animals can't get to it and so it doesn't smell as bad. Oxygen is going to be relatively common and aerobic decomposition of that material is going to be pretty high and pretty quick. But as the waste is compacted down, into um, essentially strata of waste, oftentimes strata between waste and fill dirt, 
that oxygen is going to be used up and anaerobic decomposition is going to begin. You could also, on the right here, add pressure to this too, because you'll have a little bit of pressure from all the stuff on top. You'll have some stratification. Step three, you're going to start to have some acids forming. Those acids are volatile fatty acids, which are organic acids, which result from the decomposition um, from anaerobic bacteria. And with those acids, you're going to start to get high hydrogen ion concentrations, right? The, the hydrogen is just going to pop off of those acids. Um, now, the heavy metals, you should remember, heavy metals like aluminum, arsenic, cadmium, etc., they all tend to dissolve in water at lower pH, which means that they're going to leach from your waste at this stage. So if you have electronic waste that has high levels of heavy metals, those heavy metals are going to leach out at this stage. Okay, And they'll probably start to follow water via gravity and go down um, throughout through the, the strata of the landfill. In stage four of this, the volatile fatty acids and other intermediate acid products, such as acetic acid, are going to be further decomposed by other anaerobic bacteria that produce methane, so methanogenic bacteria. And that's going to produce lots and lots of methane. Okay, That leachate is going to become pH neutral again because you're dissolving all, or sorry, you're decomposing these, um, these organic acids, but you're producing lots of methane. You have to deal with that methane in some way. You just can't have a flammable explosive gas building up in your landfill over, underneath of all this trash. Otherwise, it's liable to explode. That would be bad. So you have to vent it out. And we'll talk about how you vent it out on the next slide. But essentially what you do is just as you're building your landfill and as you're putting trash in your landfill, you just have a bunch of pipes that um, this methane can leak into and then go elsewhere. And then finally, at the bottom of your landfill, your decomposition is going to slow as the available nutrients um, are depleted. And you're going to have um, a reduction of this anaerobic respiration. And by this time, you're going to start to have a little bit of oxygen coming in because your respiration isn't super high. Your biological oxygen demand, which we typically would use in terms of waterways, but your biological oxygen demand is pretty low. So it allows what oxygen is there and that what oxygen filters through to, um, to build up in concentration. All right. And any organic matter there will dissolve or sorry, decompose um, aerobically and will eventually become humus. The problem is, is that this humus is going to be um, all around all kinds of stuff that doesn't decay. Electronic waste, metals, plastics, uh, silicates, glass, all of this stuff, a lot of toxins from, let's say, like batteries or whatever is going to be in there. So you can't really use this humus for really much, really anything. You couldn't return it back to the agricultural system. So that's essentially how a landfill, how material in a landfill is going to decompose. Now let's talk about how landfills are constructed. So like the anatomy of a landfill. When you dig this giant hole to make your landfill, what you're going to do is first line that giant hole with clay. Okay, so you have your subsoil, and then you're going to put compacted clay on top of that. You're going to basically make this um, hard pan layer of clay. And that clay will prevent any material from leaching out of the landfill into the um, subsurface, or at least that's the intention. That clay is pretty hydrophobic, um, and it's compacted, and water won't be able to get through it. Above that clay, though, you're going to put a layer of sand. And in that sand, you're going to put a leachate system. That leachate system, or these pipes, is designed to collect any leachate um, that gets through your liners. Okay, we'll talk about the liner next. What leachate is, and I have it defined on another slide, is water that contains leached metals, minerals, anything. Okay, T any type of toxin, um, really anything. So water is going to get into the landfill, and it's going to have metals that dissolve into it. It's going to have nutrients that dissolve into it. It's going to have um, like uh, persistent organic pollutants that dissolve into it, and all of it's going to um, stay in that water and it will hopefully get into these pipes and be pumped out for treatment. Okay, so you have a leachate treatment system over here. Okay. Above that layer of sand with those um, leachate collection pipes, that leachate system, you're going to have a synthetic liner 
this synthetic liner can be meters thick, um, but it's often about you know two meters thick rubber or maybe even thinner in some cases, but it's gonna be a synthetic rubber liner that's super thick that can handle the stress of being in a landfill. Okay, so that's really gonna be the one preventing all of the leachate from getting out of the landfill into the soil and into the groundwater. But if that fails, you have your backup layer, which is your clay. And then above that synthetic liner, you have a layer of sand and then leachate collection pipes. Remember that sand is, um, highly permeable to water so water can go through the sand but it's not going to go through the synthetic liner or the clay and then above that you start adding your garbage around your landfill you're going to have leachate monitoring wells um, in both the soil and the groundwater to make sure that none of the toxins that are in the landfill um, get into the soil or the surrounding or the surrounding soil or the groundwater you'll see these all over the place um, we actually have a great example of a sanitary municipal landfill right near Grandview. If you just drive down Gun Club Road heading north, you're going to see Dad's Landfill, um, D-A-D-S Landfill. And you'll see these little leachate uh, monitoring wells um, sticking up out of the ground all around that landfill um, on the property of, of the landfill. Inside the landfill itself, you're going to have a methane gas recovery system because, again, you have to pump out or allow that methane to come out um, either pumped using energy or often times just passively because it is a gas. And it will go into one of several different types of methane, um, methane uh, disposal type of things, which we'll talk about on the next slide. When you're done with the landfill, when the landfill is full, you're basically going to repeat this process as the bottom at the top. And this is what we call a cap. Okay, this at the bottom is a liner and at the top is a cap. So you're basically going to have um, a layer of clay, then a layer of sand, and then what's different about this is topsoil. Topsoil is going to allow um, grass and other plants to grow on this and it will be somewhat remediated. Okay. The reason that you have the clay, again, is because water will not go through it. So if water was to fall on this area, you know, a lot of it is just going to run off the, um, the, the hilly side of this landfill, but some of it will get into the soil. And then if it gets into the sand, it'll get into the sand, hit this clay, which is relatively impermeable or very impermeable, and run off horizontally off of the sides of this landfill. Okay, so it's to, it's designed to have the minimum amount of water get into the landfill. So there's a do, uh, there's a couple documents on Schoology that I want you guys um, to check out. One is the anatomy of a landfill, and the other is the leachate collection system in a sanitary municipal landfill. Okay. And before we get into some environmental impacts, let's look at this picture on the right. Now, this is an aerial shot of them setting up that landfill. And what you can see um, down here is the clay underneath. Well, actually, over here, I believe that you can see the clay liner underneath of the sand above that clay. And they're spreading out these, um, these layers of synthetic rubber liners. And you can see the scale of this, right? These are pretty big machines. That's a car on the road or a truck or something. Um, these are this is a pretty big facility, but there are definitely larger landfills than this. Okay, so they're just setting up those liners at the bottom. They're going to set up the leachate collection system, all of that as well. Now, after use, most of those landfills are going to become revegetated. Okay, now you're not going to put houses on this because that land is going to settle as the stuff inside decomposes. And you really couldn't do that because people would live there and it'd be... Um, potentially hazardous for them to live there. But you can turn it into a park, you can turn it into a nature preserve, you can turn it into an open space, you can just turn it into something else that has vegetation on it. All right. Um, some negative environmental impacts. Landfills can reduce carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, especially the carbon dioxide. The methane we'll talk about on the next slide. It can leach toxic chemicals into nearby soil, groundwater, or surface water. Now this is relatively common. Okay, there are many old landfills in the country, um, in the United States, where this can happen. There's accidents that can occur at modern sanitary municipal landfills. And again, around the world, um, landfills are going to vary dramatically based off of um, the socioeconomics of that country, of that area, of that city, of that part of the city, as well as the laws and, le and legislation that exist in that country. 
Okay. One of the big things in my eye, probably because I'm a gardener, is that landfills sequester plant available nutrients. Okay. So you take all of this plant matter, all of these nutrients that would be great to return to the soil and an agricultural system, and you essentially funnel them all into the landfill and sequester them in the landfill. You can't get all these plant available nutrients out, all of this humus out of the landfill because it's all contaminated with all this hazardous waste and toxic materials and heavy metals and all of that stuff. So it's essentially lost to the agricultural system, which is increasing our demand for synthetic fertilizers, which as an organic gardener, I'm totally against, okay? Now, some of these problems. The first one, let's talk about waste gas. And specifically, let's talk about methane. Okay, so methane is going to result from methanogenic bacteria in your landfill. Most landfills are going to um, capture that methane using a methane capture system, but not all landfills. Some landfills are just going to have pipes that go through that landfill and allow that methane to passively um, go into those pipes. And then those pipes are going to terminate at the top of the landfill or along the sides in this candy cane looking structure. And that candy cane looking structure that's just a pipe allows methane to vent into the atmosphere, right? But not allow water to get into that pipe because, you know, rainwater isn't going to, you know, magically jump jump into that pipe right so you'll get these candy cane looking pipes at some landfills you can actually see old versions of that at dad's landfill but it looks to me as though all of those have been um, capped and they're now directing that methane into a methane capture system a lot of landfills are going to flare the waste methane just burn it now that's um pretty bad because you're just wasting that methane now it's it's not as bad as just allowing that methane to go up into the atmosphere where it can like remain and act as a greenhouse gas for the for the lifetime of that methane however short it is but flaring it is just wasting it right why would you waste this methane that you could otherwise capture and use at a power plant okay besides flaring endangers birds this um looks like a hawk or a falcon um was too close to a flare tower and these flare towers you can't see very well during the day and it got its wings singed. Many birds have died from these flare towers. Um, a lot of places nowadays are capturing and utilizing this gas for power generation. Um, this is an example of that. This is a landfill gas power plant um, in France. Again, methane is just the same as methane that we would use as natural gas, right? So why not capture it and use it? If you're going to produce it anyway and the good thing about this is that this is technically biogas and it is technically renewable okay um, it's at least carbon neutral in a sense not not so much if it's like from coming from plastics or coming from any type of fossil fuel in there but if it's coming from uh, plant matter it is so here's where i define leachate for you again it's water that's carrying any any minerals that have leached out of um, really any system it could be metals, minerals, toxins, um, nutrients, fertilizers, what have you, okay? So when the landfill is open to the elements, rainfall is gonna fall on that landfill. It's unavoidable. And it's gonna percolate down um, through all that trash and it's going to dissolve anything that's water soluble along the way. And again, if we're making a lot of acids in that landfill and the pH is going down, that means that heavy metals are more often gonna get into your leachate. So metals will dissolve easier at, at lower um, pH. Modern landfills have ways to prevent this. Okay, They have a storm collection system. Um, this is essentially a cap and a drainage system that prevents rainwater from entering that landfill. Most often they're going to be installed when the landfill is closed, but often they'll install it in sections of the landfill as it's being used, and then they'll remove it and then um, use that section again to build up and then, um, you know, kind of use it sequentially through the landfill. Hi. Yep. Um, we also have leachate collection systems. These are essentially pipes that go throughout the landfill, like I've talked about, that collect and process that leachate through the landfill. So you have all this leachate that's going into the landfill, collecting at the bottom, um, and goes into these pipes, gets pumped up, and is treated. And then again, the synthetic liners at the bottom, which we talked about at length. All right, so landfills are 
Okay, they're, they're, they're great in what they do. You take all of your waste, especially your hazardous waste that you don't want out in the environment, your stuff that doesn't decompose, your stuff that can't be recycled or reused, and you put it into a landfill. Okay, it's not bad. It's better than having it um, in the oceans, for example. But what are some ways to mitigate these negative effects of landfills? Well, the first is to just stop producing so much damn trash, right? Reducing the amount of stuff that we use. Um, the United States, again, is the most wasteful society on the planet. And by reducing the amount of um, material goods that we use, that reduces the amount of materials that end up in a landfill. If we reuse things, that means that we use things more than once and it repurposes materials and it keeps that material out of the landfill at least for a while. You know, sometimes you reuse it as much as you can until it eventually breaks, but at least it keeps it out of the landfill for quite a while. Okay, and then recycling. So we'll talk about recycling on the next one. These um, three you'll often see written as the three R's and you probably just remember that from elementary school. So recycling. Now, recycling is not the panacea that's going to save us from ourselves, okay? I want to be crystal clear about that, but recycling can be good. Um, it is good, okay? But only some materials can be recycled. They can be reprocessed and converted into new materials. Some plastics can be recycled. Um, I'm going to show a documentary in class about that, um, but at least I'm thinking I am. Not all plastics can be recycled. That's a huge myth that we've been um, misled by the petrochemical companies, the oil companies, into believing that all plastics can be recycled and that they can be infinitely recycled. That is absolutely not the case. Metals can definitely be recycled. Paper, cardboard can be recycled. In fact, cardboard is the most recycled material in the United States, even more so than metals. Some textiles can be recycled. Not very common, but some textiles can be recycled. The other thing that I would put on here is glass. Glass can definitely be recycled. Recycling reduces the demand for raw materials. Um, this is the same for reducing and reusing. All three of these reduce the demand for these raw materials, whatever the raw material is, paper for trees, or sorry, trees for paper, um, whatever. Some drawbacks. Recycling is expensive, okay? Um, it takes a lot of energy to break down these materials and to re, um, take plastics down to their polymers, for example, or to melt glass or to melt uh, metals. But the amount of material, uh, the amount of energy that it takes to um, melt glass the first time is essentially the same as it takes to melt glass the second time. So it's not, um, it's not cost restrictive in that sense. It is labor intensive. One of the worst things that I think that we've done in terms of recycling is single stream recycling, where you put all of your recyclable materials into one bin and somebody else has to sort through it. I remember when I was a kid, we had different bins and we had to have different bins for our different materials. So we had a bin for glass, aluminum, um, steel, we had a bin for paper, etc. And we would take those to a recycling facility and each one of those we would dump into their own respective dumpsters to be taken to a recycling um, plant or however, wherever they were taken. Single stream recycling means that they have to be mechanically or manually sorted and has led to a huge spike in what we call wish cycling. Basically saying like, uh, I don't know if it's recyclable, but I'll throw it in there just in case. We'll again see that in the documentary that I hope to show in class. And it can be potentially dangerous, dangerous for workers, especially broken glass and electronic waste. If you're sorting through all of this single stream recycling and you're trying to get um, pieces of glass away from your paper, that's just inherently dangerous. Okay, Electronic waste, we're going to talk about on its own slide, so I'll skip that for now. Metals and glass can be infinitely recycled. That means that you can melt down an aluminum can and make it into another aluminum can over and over and over and over again, infinitely, or at least pretty much infinitely. Most plastics, if they can be recycled, again, only some plastics can, they're typically only can be recycled once or twice. You can't take a um, PET bottle, like your typical water bottle, and recycle it again and again and again and make a, um, like a water bottle from a recycled old water bottle over and over and over and over like you can with a glass bottle. After they've been recycled once or twice, they're typically downcycled. And I'll, I'll show that on the next slide, but the, um, the, the definitions here. 
And then paper typically recycled five to seven times before it is down, down cycled and then it can't be recycled again. So I think that these other two terms should be um, more common in everyday speech because we talk about downcycling as though it is recycling, which it's not. Recycling, the chasing arrows, implies that this material can be reused infinitely, right? Again, aluminum cans, glass bottles can be infinitely recycled into new ones. Downcycling means that the recycled material is gonna be of a lower quality. So think about the paper pulp that makes egg cartons that is often downcycled from copy paper, right? The paper that you all are going to recycle a mountain of after this class is over, right? Um, you can't go the other way around. There's no backwards arrow in this. And in that sense, it can be recycled, right? Paper can be recycled five to seven times before those fibers are too broken up and too damaged and too destroyed and you have to make something like an egg carton something that is this weird pulpy paper upcycling is really cool upcycling is essentially a form of reusing and it's taking um material from one purpose and transforming that waste material into a new product so making furniture out of pallet wood would be a great example old busted pallets that you can't that the company isn't going to take back, make some furniture out of it. Okay, that's upcycling. Now these three videos are great. Um, one of these two I'm going to put, um, I'm going to hopefully play in class, so we'll wait for that. If you're really interested in this, um, you know, I'd like to show this one in class also, but whatever ones I don't show in class, check out on your own. They're pretty awesome. Now let's look at some other ways to mitigate the negative effects of landfills. One of those is composting. Composting in my mind is huge. You take all that organic matter that you would otherwise throw into a landfill and you put it into a compost bin. And even if you don't do this at home, you can sign up for a compost collection agency that will come and do it for you. Now what's really cool is that in many other areas of the world, and I don't see it very often in the United States, maybe some more progressive cities, but in many areas of the world, you'll see bins specifically for organic waste. Um, traveling in Mexico, Central America, Europe, you're gonna see bins that are specifically for organic waste, and that's to keep, it, keep that organic waste from getting wasted in a landfill. And they go to composting facilities, municipal composting facilities, and then they're sold. Um, they sell this really great humus or this compost to farmers or gardeners to use. It's a great way to mitigate the negative effects of landfills. You reduce your, um, your methane emissions and carbon dioxide emissions from the landfill. You reduce the amount of synthetic fertilizers that you depend on in the agricultural system, all of that. So what is compost? Compost is basically the process of taking organic waste and turning it into um, humus. And that humus we call compost. And you can use all kinds of materials for that. It could include yard waste, like your grass clippings or your dead leaves in the autumn. It can include food scraps, animal waste, uh, typically not dog and cat, but I'm thinking like chicken manure, um, stuff like old straw. Um, crop residues would be old straw. Untreated paper or cardboard, so stuff that isn't bleached or coated in a nonstick coating, all of that can be composted. And it's going to return those nutrients back to the agricultural system or even to a natural system. Um, there's a lot of groups that are putting compost in natural uh, systems as well to improve soil quality. Some of the drawbacks of composting. You can release carbon dioxide and methane, but it's carbon neutral, right? This watermelon grew in a single growing season, carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere, drawn down through photosynthesis um, to create the tissue of this watermelon plant, including the watermelon fruit. And then whatever is wasted, not eaten, even the stuff that is eaten is going through cellular respiration and it's gonna produce carbon dioxide again, but you know, no net increase of carbon dioxide. In fact, you have a net reduction of carbon dioxide because this dark organic, I mean, this dark humus is high in organic matter. A lot of that is carbon. So the darker and blacker your compost is, the more carbon it's gonna contain, and it's a really great way to sequester carbon in the soil. So it's carbon neutral or even um, a way to draw down carbon. Okay. Many of these industrial systems for composting is going to collect the methane and it's going to use it as a biogas. Okay. Either sell it or use it on site. 
Some other drawbacks, AP and their learning objectives tells you that it smells. I've been composting for over a, like over 15 years and I will tell you that it does not smell unless you do it wrong. What it does smell like is really, really good soil, that like rich, earthy, like humid forest soil. It smells really good. Now you might smell like coffee grounds if you just add a bunch of coffee grounds from the local coffee shop on top of it, or it might smell like a lot of citrus if you just pressed a lot of oranges into uh, orange juice and you have a lot of um, oranges on top, but it doesn't smell bad unless you're doing it wrong or unless you're doing some anaerobic system like Bokashi composting. Now what it does, but, but AP says it smells, so on the AP test say it smells, okay? What it does do is can attract rodents, right? If you live in bear country, you might be um, attracting bears, you might be attracting raccoons, you might be attracting birds, etc. But that's not that big of a deal in my eyes. Okay, we'll watch this short little clip about composting, but if you're not gonna be in class, check it out. It's really cool to watch a time last of composting. Um, this is a composting facility, I wanna say in Germany, um, where they have all of this compost going. It's at a late stage of decomposition. And you notice that there is a pipe coming out into this pipe. And this pipe goes into it and has a bunch of pipes in there to collect the, the uh, methane. You can probably see some of those back here collecting the methane. And that methane is gonna be collected in these storage tanks and it's gonna be sold for industry. And what's really cool about this facility, you can see the solar panels on top. All right, moving right on, um, electronic waste. Now, electronic waste is also called e-waste. We've mentioned it several times in this. It's any type of electronic that enters the waste stream, okay? So it enters um, your, your trash system, okay? Any type of electronic. This is a very complex waste. It includes all kinds of plastics, metals, silicates. It has all kinds of other materials. It might have some acids and transistors. It might have some persistent organic pollutants. It can have all kinds of really different materials in it. And if you're gonna recycle these materials, it has to be uh, dismantled. And some of it is really difficult to get at if you, um, w without, creating further environmental um, harm. So for example, it's really easy to recycle copper, but it's really difficult to strip copper wires from the plastic sheathing or insulation around that wire. What people typically default to doing is burning that plastic off. Well, that's gonna release a lot of dioxins and is one of the leading causes of dioxins to be released into the atmosphere, which are a type of persistent organic pollutant. Okay, so it's really difficult to get to that copper in some cases without um, further damaging the environment. Many of these um, electronic uh, sources of electronic waste can, re can, re can leach um, synthetic petrochemicals, heavy metals, and other toxins into your landfills, or if they're dumped um, illegally, right into the soil or water. So let's talk about um, illegal dumping. Well, landfills are expensive and they won't take certain types of waste, right? I, if I'm really poor and I don't have the money to dispose of an old mattress properly, well, you know, to pay the dumping fee at the landfill, well, maybe I'll just take it um, in the middle of the night to the end of the road and dump it into the ditch, right, out in the country, okay? That's illegal dumping. Um, so cost and regulations can be, be prohibited. And again, certain materials won't be accepted on landfill because they're too hazardous. So what most people will do, or maybe not most people, what some people will do is just illegally dump them rather than dispose of them properly um, according to code. Okay, now this could range from anything from household appliances. Um, you'll see, right, dryers and refrigerators on the side of the road in some areas. Um, you'll see tires, yard waste is very common. You'll see like just dead trees on the side of the road on the way to the landfill. And the idea is that people don't wanna pay the dumping fee, but instead they'll just cut down the tree that died in their yard and then dump it in the ditch and somebody else will come along and pick it up. Some of these materials are potentially toxic. Again, tires we've talked about before, they leach synthetic plastics, um, synthetic rubbers and heavy metals into the soil or into the water. But tires also have a other negative um, aspect. I don't know if you can see this very well, but they collect water in the rim of those tires. That water is a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes, which can spread disease like malaria or typhoid fever. Um, so in many areas where they have really bad problems with people uh, dumping tires, they at least have mandates for the people to slash the tires um, to cut them so they drain before they're dumped. Another example is batteries. Before, um, before uh, auto stores had battery exchange programs, 
Batteries were one of the most um, illegally dumped items in the United States, and they leak sulfuric acid and other types of acids, right? Battery acid, um, and all kinds of other nasty stuff out of those, right? Heavy metals as well. Even the AA batteries that we often throw into the trash can shouldn't be going into the trash can and into the landfill. They should be going somewhere else, okay? Um, to a proper disposal facility. All right, and let's end this with another law. This is um, the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, CERCLA. I'm going to call it CERCLA from here on out. This is a U.S. law. It's also called Superfund. I'll try not to say that because how you're going to see it um, on the test is CERCLA, but oftentimes in the press, you'll see it as Superfund. This is a 1980 law that charges the EPA to investigate and clean up sites that have been contaminated with hazardous waste or any other type of hazardous um, pollutant. Okay, the most so the, so the EPA will go and investigate these sites, and the most contaminated are put on what they call the national priorities list, which is within this law. Okay, the the ones that are on the national priorities list are the ones that are supposed to be cleaned up ASAP. The goal of this is to reduce health and environmental risk from pollutants, especially hazardous pollutants, and to remediate sites to be used um, for any, others, any other reason after, afterwards. Now, unfortunately, Superfund, or CERCLA rather, is massively underfunded. Um, it's had its budget um, slashed many times by every um, administration, uh, Republican or Democrat. And Right now, there is about 1,600 sites on the national priorities list that are being um, cleaned up. With it, beyond that, there's 40,000 Superfund sites in the United States. So we have done a very good job of disposing of hazardous materials improperly um, for a very long time. Now, historically, cleanup should be paid for by the polluter. Typically, that is a company that is responsible for the pollution. but what happens if that company goes bankrupt? Or what happens if that company is bought by, by another company and that new company refuses to pay um, for the cleanup, for take responsibility for the actions of the previous company, right? Like uh, one small company gets bought by a multi-million dollar large um, conglomerate. Well, that conglomerate had nothing to do with the initial pollution because they're not the ones that polluted. It's the company that they bought. You see what I mean? So about 70% of the cleanups have been funded by the polluters. The remainder is taxpayer funded. Okay. So what kicked this all off is the Love Canal disaster. Again, something I hope to watch in class, but if you're not going to be in class, um, check this out on your own. And down here in the bottom left, you see a map of the Superfund sites as of um, October 2013. You can see how distributed around the United States they are. And what I want you to notice is that they're more distributed in heavily populated areas, right? North Dakota doesn't have many because there's not very many people and very much industry there. But the upper Midwest, um, the uh, East Coast, California, they have quite a few. Currently, about 50 million people live within three miles of a Superfund site. If you think about the U.S. population, again, of 333 million, that's a pretty good chunk of the U.S. population. What is that, a sixth, a seventh of the U.S. population? An example that we have locally in Colorado, you know, it's a nice little cluster right there around Denver, um, is Rocky Flats. Rocky Flats was a um, an area, I, it was a facility uh, where they created the plutonium buttons for atomic bombs. So they weren't making atomic bombs there. They were just making the plutonium buttons or the plutonium trigger for the atomic bombs. And there was a long history of leaks of plutonium um, around this site. And plutonium, as you well should know, is uh, radioactive. And it was listed as a super fun site and remediated. Okay, uh, right now it is a wildlife refuge. Um, this is down at the bottom is an example of dredging of the Hudson by General Electric. General Electric spent billions of dollars dredging the Hudson River where they dumped PCBs for years, for decades. Okay, So it should be, again, clean, um, funded by the uh, company that's responsible, but not, not um, always is. Now, if we just look at Colorado, notice these ones in the mountains. Not all Superfund sites have to be, maybe that one's in Colorado Springs, but the, not all Superfund sites are going to be um, due to industry. Some of them 
like in the Colorado Rockies are going to be due to old mines, right? They're, they're going to be due to all kinds of um, all kinds of activities that have created hazardous waste, not just industry, but industry is one of the leading causes. Now I said that was the last lane, but I lied. This is the last lane, haha, ha, fooled you. Uh, illegal dumping, just in the ocean. We hit on this when we talked about um, litter, but I thought we should expand on it. Now many people have assumed incorrectly that the world's oceans are so big that it has an unlimited ability to mix and purify waste. That is absolutely not true. You see some of these images of uh, waste going into the ocean, and this isn't really that far removed from home. Before 1972, the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act, which you do not need to know, um, hundreds of millions of tons of U.S. waste were dumped in the ocean. It was just way easier to do that than to dispose of them properly in landfills. Okay, but that pattern of dumping occurs really worldwide, um, primarily in the developing world, where they lack the laws and legislation to, and the infrastructure and the economies to prevent this. In the developed world, it's much less common, but it really does depend. Again, on local economy, regulations, infrastructure, um, that's the largest determinant of where your waste ends up. If you don't have the infrastructure, um, you know, like the garbage trucks running 24 seven to pick up trash on the curb, your trash is gonna end up in, in you know, illegal dumps um, or the ocean, okay? And just a couple um, quotes to illustrate this. The first one is from Dr. Jan Post, who is a marine biologist. Um, she says that the ocean today has become an overexploited resource and mankind's ultimate cesspool, the last destination for all pollution. Now, if you don't know what a cesspool is, look it up. It's really, really gross. The second quote from Dr. Patricia Tester, who's an oceanographer, the oceans have become nothing but giant cesspools. And you know what happens when you heat up a cesspool. Essentially what that's saying, and I'll tell you what a cesspool is, it's a shit pool. Um, a cesspool is a pool that they used to use in, um, before sewage treatment, where you would just, all of the human waste would be funneled into this pool. Okay, so, so it's a shit pool. Um, this is essentially saying that if you heat up that um, that pool full of feces, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have a massive algal bloom. It's gonna smell like high heaven. Um, it's disgusting. And that's what's happening with the world's oceans. You're seeing on the bottom um, two pictures of eutrophication events, a green algae example and a red algae example, also known as a red tide. And then on the bottom right, you were seeing um, a dump that is right next to the ocean, or at least what I'm presuming to be the ocean, and even a couple people swimming in that water. Okay, who knows what toxins they're being exposed to right then. And if I haven't given you enough um, videos to check out, check out these ones, um, pretty interesting. People are always asking this question, so I thought I'd throw this video in. Uh, this is a really cool way to use um, old plastic bricks because again, we'll talk about plastic and how hard it is to recycle it. Um, so recycled bricks made of recycled plastic, pretty cool. It's essentially like a giant Lego brick that you can build houses of. Okay, so that was a lot in this PowerPoint. Um, the essential knowledge, solid waste is any discard material that's not a liquid or gas, it's generated in any type of sector. Solid waste is most often disposed of in landfills. Landfills can contaminate groundwater and they can release harmful gases, okay? So that if, there, if, if you do have a problem with that leachate collection system, um, you can contaminate soil and groundwater with that leachate and then it can release harmful gases. The most notable of which is methane, but you can release others, but we didn't really talk about. Um, we talked about electronic waste and sanitary municipal landfills and how they are created. And then describing the effects of landfills, um, or solid, sorry, describing the effects of solid waste disposal methods, um, factors in landfill decomposition. We talked about the stages of decomposition in landfill. Uh, solid waste can be disposed of through incineration. That is really in our energy unit, so check it out there. And then some items may not be accepted in sanitary municipal landfills. They're often disposed of illegally, right? Illegal dumping. An example of that is batteries, uh, tires, et cetera. Tires um, specifically can become breeding ground for mosquitoes. And then some countries dispose of their waste by dumping in the ocean. That's really bad. And most of the um, effects of that check out in that litter PowerPoint, aquatic pollution and litter. That practice, um, 
has led to large floating islands of trash in the ocean. I really wish they didn't use that term, large floating islands. Um, but those are the garbage patches that we talked about in that litter PowerPoint. Okay. So hope you guys learned something. And um, never mind, we have one more slide. Because we, we have one more learning objective. Um, we talked about recycling. So certain solid waste can be recycled, converted into new products. Recycling is one way to stem the flow of our demand for any type of material. It doesn't have to be minerals. It could be trees, right? If we're talking about paper or um, cardboard. Composting is great for reducing um, um, the, the waste that goes into a landfill. Again, they say it smells. I tend, I, I disagree. Uh, electronic waste can be recycled and reused, but it's very dangerous for the workers um, and it is relatively dangerous to do. Metals such as lead and mercury can leach from um, that material as well. Uh, landfill mitigation strategies range from burning waste to energy to re uh, restoring habitat. Again, remember that a lot of European countries are resorting to burning waste as a form of electricity production. Again, go back to the um, energy resources PowerPoints. And then combustion of gases produced from decomposition of organic ma materials in landfill can be used um, for energy. This is biogas, right? Methane. All right. So I hope you guys learned something and I'll see you all in class. Bye.